Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Rancho Mirage Public Library. My name is David Bryant. I have the best job in the world, and that is being the director of this great city department, this great library. Thank you all for coming. We uh, look forward to this program every year because this is our means of partnering with the city's Historical Preservation Commission. They do fabulous work. You'll be hearing a lot more about that as the afternoon goes on. I wanted to introduce to you Randy Binder, our city manager in the front row. Randy, very supportive of... Uh, Randy has spent basically a lifetime working for the city of Rancho Mirage. When did you start, age three or four? No, he really did. He started right out of graduate school and he has been with this great city ever since and his imprint is, is uh, to be noted and important. Uh, he's a planner and he's a great city manager, so thank you, Randy. The uh, other announcement that I have is a quickie. When this panel is complete and the conversation is ended, we ask that you, if you so choose, stay in your seats or get up and stretch a little bit. We'll have probably a five minute gap. And we will then show a movie entitled Desert Maverick, a movie about William Cody, which may be of interest to you. It's part of Modernism Week. We uh, know that that movie runs 78 minutes if you have planning involved, so just keep that in mind too. So at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Charles Townsend, member of the city council and a terrific friend. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure to be here, needless to say. And I am Charles Townsend, a member of the city council of this wonderful city of Rancho Mirage. So good afternoon and welcome to this forum on the work and life of William F. Cody. This program was organized by the Rancho Mirage Historic Preservation Commission the commissioners are here with us today, and I'd like to introduce them to you. And we will start with our chair, Ray Keller, can't be here. He had uh, cataract surgery, I was told, so he is in LA. But we do have our vice chair, Dan Schwartz. There you are. And commissioner, Carol Leibowitz, Carol. Robert Saffron and Robert Birch, right there. Over the last 10 years, Rancho Mirage has designated through this group over 60 properties as historic in the city of Rancho Mirage. And the work still continues, and I think they've done a wonderful job in recognizing everything that we have here in Rancho Mirage. It's not all about Palm Springs. We are just as big as they are. So, <laughs> I said it, I said it. Now to our panelists, and if I can get through all these names, and if I make a mistake, forgive me. We are here with our panelists, Joe Loria, right here. And Joe is the Los Angeles-based creator, writer, and educator she received her um, cura, cura, curatorial, how do you say curatorial. curatorial training at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. She is a specialist in the field of design and has explored objects and environments that define the California lifestyle. And also culture through publications and exhibitions, among them California design, Chronicle Books, 2004, The Golden State of Craft, California, 1960 through 1985, Craft in America, 2011. Additionally, she has authored monographs and organized exhibitions for seminal California artists, most recently Peter Shire, did I say that right? Yeah. Very good. Public work for the Architectural and Design Museum in Ralph Bassera, thank you, exquisite beauty for Ben Maltz Gallery at the Otis, Car Otis College of Art and Design. Currently, Loria is a member of the exhibition team that is organizing and exhibiting entitled Back to the Future, William F. Cody, Visionary Architect. 
an examination of Cody's groundbreaking architectural schedule to open in July of this year at the Architectural and Design Museum in Los Angeles. Now that's saying something. Very good, very good. <laughs> Jill Lori, she also put together this beautiful uh, afternoon event that you are now attending. So welcome to Joe. Appreciate it. Our next panelist is Dr. Don Choi, right over there. Did I say that right? Perfect. Very good, thank you, and then I can move on. Dr. Choi is an architectural historian who focuses on modernism in Japan and California. He holds degrees from Princeton University, Rice University, and a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. He is currently a professor of architecture at California Polytechnic State University, as well as overseeing research association of the Institute of Industrial Science at Tokyo University in Japan. Whew. Well, I'm still going, I'm still going here, guys. <laughs> at Cal Poly, Dr. Joy, teaches courses in architectural history and theory, and along with his students, has been investigating the work of William F. Cody. Did I miss anything? Did I get it? Welcome to you, too. <laughs> and now we have Emily Bills, received her PhD in History of Architectural and Urban Planning from the Institute of Fine Arts, at New York University. She is participating adjunct professor and coordinator of the Urban Studies Program at Woodbury University and former managing director of the Julius Shulman Institute. She is also the California coordinator for the Society of Architectural Historians, Archipedia Project, Emily's work on telephone infrastructure and the development of Los Angeles received a Graham Foundation Cardi Manny Award Citation of Special Recognition. And that's a mouthful. Let me see what else she has done here. Her work on architectural and urbanism has been published in many journalists and books, including an upcoming contribution to Michigan Modern, Design That Shaped America, she has curated exhibitions on Helene Benet, Pedro E. Guerrero, Catherine Opie, and Richard Barnes, among others. Emily is currently working on a book about architectural photographer Marvin Rand to be published by, and I can't say it. Say it? Fiden. Fiden. Thank you. I have three different interpretations of that one, so I appreciate that. Thank you for being with us, Emily. Also on the dais is a very special guest, you right down there, Kathy Cody Nemirotsky. Did I do it? I did it. Very good. She is a residential designer, activist, writer, and researcher for the William F. Cody Papers. Kathy is a member of the exhibition team for the upcoming exhibition entitled Back to the Future, William F. Cody Visionary Architect. And Kathy, by the way, is the daughter of Mr. William Cody. So let's have a pause for <laughs> And I think I got through it, because now I can turn it over, thank God, to Joe Lorraine. I'll hand you the microphone, dear. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Charles for those wonderful uh, bios. I um, hope, hope that it inspired you to stay awake and didn't put you to sleep. I want to thank you all for coming today and sharing this beautiful um, Rancho Mirage afternoon with us here at the library. And Rancho Mirage has a very special connection with our Cody project, as it is where Bill designed both the Thunderbird and Tamarisk country clubs. We want to extend a sincere thank you to David Bryant, director of the library, and his energetic staff who have taken care of all the myriad details associated with putting on such an event as this. Also, 
a special shout out to the City Council of Rancho Mirage and all of the commissioners who've taken the time out of their day to come and listen to our presentation and also for their generous support of Modernism Week. So thank you all. Now I'm going to, to turn to the task at hand, uh, which is to provide you with a bit of background information about this project, which has been 10 years in the making. Yes, I said 10 years. A, a decade ago, I was introduced to Kathy Cody, um, who you see on the screen with her family in a portrait when she was of, of a young age, and you see a professional portrait of William F. Cody, as we like to call him, Bill, Wild Bill at some times. So I was introduced to Kathy by my dear friend and designer, Charles Hollis Jones, who some of you may know because uh, he does show his wonderful acrylic and metal furniture here in the desert. Charles, you can sort of say hello to everybody. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. So Charles introduced me to Kathy, as I said, a decade ago, and that's when all the trouble started. I learned from Kathy about her family history and dis discovered that she still had the original archival material from her father's architectural practice. Well, you know, when a curator discovers this, they begin to salivate, um, especially if you like to work with original primary research materials. These materials have subsequently been donated, for the most part, to the Kennedy Library at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And it was that opportunity that we were able to meet Professor Don Choi, who we thought um, had a great idea, which was to use the, Car the Cody archives by assigning his students the task of interpreting what Cody architecture means to them today. The genesis of the inspiration to develop this exhibition on the life and career of William Cody um, and eventually produce a complementary publication that's aspirational, um, we believe that this exhibition and book will solidify and protect Cody's legacy in and this is our main goal, and also uh, educate the public. The exhibition um, is going to take place at the new downtown location of the Architecture and Design Museum, which should be on the screen, and you see two views of it. It was just recently uh, moved from the Wilshire location and the Gensler architectural firm did all the build out. But you might ask, why Los Angeles and not Palm Springs? And that would be a fair question. Firstly, we felt it was important to premiere the exhibition this year as it is the centennial of Cody's uh, birthday. Uh, so it, it was important to have this celebration. And as Kathy Cody said to us this morning, this is the beginning of Bill's birthday party for his 100th year. So we're all going to celebrate later. Secondly, we thought it was important to develop a broader public awareness. Of course, Cody is known as being an architect of the desert or of the greater Coachella Valley. Uh, but in reality, Cody also had offices in other parts of the country and developed major projects across the American West, Hawaii, Mexico, and Havana, Cuba. So what should you know about William Cody? Well, a lot of you are probably um, aficionados already and are probably very yeah thank you and I'm probably a very aware of the Julia Shulman photographs <clears throat> excuse me that have shown his major commissions but what you might not know was that Bill was a tremendously talented 
artist at a very young age. I would almost say he was a savant in that area. Now, my background is actually in the fine arts, and my contribution to this exhibition was that I wanted to discuss this artistic side of Bill Cody. It's a side that most of you, as I said, um, will find uh, very revealing. These two watercolor studies, uh, sort of the painted Victorian lady and a California mission style, imagine that Bill did these probably around the age of 10 to 12. Most boys were, were enduring puberty, <laughs> and Bill was deciding his color palette. Um, Bill was encouraged to be an artist very early by his mother, who was a, an artist and interior designer of some notoriety. She would take her two sons, Bill and, and Jay, out on uh, ex, sort of um, excavations, I'd like to call them. They would go around the Los Angeles area and try to dig up interesting properties to, to draw. And um, that's how Bill learned architectural style from that very tender age. And sometimes they'd go out into the um, countryside, and here's a typical drawing that Bill did in plein air, just sitting outside with his easel, his mother and brother. I mean, what a great beginning of anybody's story. When Bill was in high school at Beverly Hills High, he and Jack Warner Jr. Uh, worked on uh, set construction and designing sets for the theater department. And here you see two absolutely glorious um, watercolor studies. Uh, the detail is unimaginable when you see these drawings in person. And this is what seduced me into this project. Um, just uh, Bill's deft hand. I thought I've never really experienced this uh, in, in an architect. And here's a more um, typical architectural drawing of a, pers it's a perspective drawing that Bill did when he was at USC School of Architecture, and he was there from 1940 to 1942. And we can see the beginning of Cody's imagination at play as he's designing this, these sculptural structures, particularly the oculus opening with the tree penetrating through the roof. You want to point that? Um, and this, this sort of um, trope, Cody would come back to in later concepts in his design for future clients. Uh, if you can see in the lower uh, part of the drawing, uh, in red, Cody received a pass grade from the instructor. And this was because Cody had this, um, I guess, I'd have to say, um, he was a kind of a procrastinator in a way. He always turned in, not always, but sometimes turned in his assignments late. So he was very human um, in that aspect. While he was at USC, he, he did these beautiful color studies. This is just one detail of a much larger drawing that it was his imagination uh, to re-envision Gump's department store, or Gump's Gallery. And I, Cody's color palette and compositional skills rendered in, the, in these drawings are dynamic and very dramatic. Uh, as a USC student, Cody learned to create drawings that emphasized an integrated design of structures and landscape that clearly showed the positioning of the built environment on the natural site. Again, he's beginning to evolve the kinds of architectural skills that will, will come much in handy in his professional career. I added in this drawing because it's one of my favorites. It's a USC assignment uh, of, a, of an institutional structure that Bill titled Drawing for Nautical Museum, and it demonstrates his dramatic use of the chiaroscuro technique in graphite and charcoal. And if you didn't know that this was an architectural drawing, I think you would 
just covet it for the beauty of his shading. Um, in his professional practice, uh, which this drawing um, derives from, Cody often took artistic license with stylized, with stylized elements. He was precise in, in, in rendering structures, but he expressed a whimsicality in the rendering of trees and the backdrop of the mountain. If you look closely at this, you can see the, um, what I like to call these sort of lollipop trees. And then this was so curious to me, it's almost like a parade of flags that become a cluster of trees. And, you know, students today of architecture don't really draw as much as they used to, or not draw at all. They use a lot of AutoCAD programs. So I think Bill did not have access to that. So at some point, he really shortcut it the procedure, but he did it in such a wonderful, whimsical way. This drawing for a mortuary, if you look very closely, you can see the skull <laughs> that Cody inserted. I think he was having a big laugh. And then this looks like the artery that comes out of a heart, and he's integrated it so well um, in, in the rendering. So we, as we said, one of our objectives, or main, I should say the main objective, is to further the legacy of Bill Cody. Unfortunately, because he died at a young age, and young for all of us, because it was, well, for some of us, it was 1978 when he passed away, I think he sort of became forgotten. Now, I have a book at home that's, you know, about this thick and weighs about five pounds, and I don't take it out very often for the reason that it's about this thick and weighs five pounds. But it is an encyclopedia of American architecture, and it was published in 1981. And my first in informational search about Cody, I went to that book, and I thought, I'm going to find him. And he's not in that book. So it wasn't until later, in some publications, that Bill started to get the recognition he deserved. And in 2012, as you can see, the Palm Springs Architecture and Design Museum uh, awarded Bill Cody the recognition of a star out in front of the museum. So the next time you're walking there, you can pay homage um, to Bill Cody, which I think is, is wonderful, because there's obviously a new consciousness arising about Bill Cody and his work. So another way that Bill Cody showed his architectural um, leanings, not in just drawings, but actually on the job, was he would design every detail. You know, he believed in that holistic environment like Frank Lloyd Wright called organic architecture. And here you see um, from El Dorado Country Club, this is the lobby leading into the dining room, and uh, Bill designed these interesting patterns of positive and negative space in these concrete block designs. He was not afraid of texture. Some people think of modernist architects as being very clean line, rectilinear, you know, down to the essentialism, but that wasn't Cody at all. He really thought about layered texture, and I think he got a lot of that from his mother, the interior designer. Here you see a close-up of El Dorado Country Club dining room bar that shows Cody's use of the geometric forms as seen in this cluster of the hanging lights which are basically modeled on sphere shapes. Um, and also you can see his floating canopy of wood struts through which these lamps, these ceiling lights are hung. Look at the amount of pattern that is shown uh, in that just one space of the ceiling, which most people think of the ceiling as being a throwaway. I mean, how often do you look up? Well, here, Bill is forcing you to follow the line up to the roof line. Um, Bill's great use of, of design of lighting fixtures has always been one of my favorites, and I like to refer to this as the spider lamp. Um, whether or not it is, don't, you know, 
That's just my, um, my little uh, pet name for it. But you can see that his attention to detail uh, was, was wonderfully uh, exquisite and complete. Um, so the next lighting fixture that um, I think is really uh, wonderful to bring to your attention is the, the design treatment of the, of the light um, that he also put on the exteriors of his commissions. Note the Cody design uh, in the, on the yellow paper, uh, where he demonstrates his classical division of space into equal proportions, and he has a mathematical approach to his pattern. How many people, how many designers think these things through, um, you know, especially when it's an exterior uh, accessory? I, I think that to Cody, it was very much his way of approaching every commission. This exterior light is a, is a fine example. It shows Cody's clarity of design achieved through the layering of geometric structures that emphasize the contrast of materials and light and dark polarities. And this is the exterior lighting fixture that was designed for the Sam and Gladys Rubenstein residence. And Cody designed this and installed this as his housewarming gift to the Rubensteins. He was a very generous man. The other aspect of Cody that I consider to be very much part of his creative activity was that he would work with artists to uh, use their work in his spaces. Here you see uh, the John Mason sculptures in the background here. Oops, let me go forward, sorry. Where did I go to? I, I must have really gone forward, backwards, forward. Okay. Oh, now I'm going backwards. Okay. We'll get there. Seventh inning stretch. All right. So here are the. <laughs> and now I know what's wrong. It was upside down. Here are the sculptures <laughs> by John Mason. I'm, a, I'm an artist. I'm left brain or right brain or whatever part of the brain that's not <laughs> systematic. So this, you know, th th this commission for the Palm Springs Spa was just a wonderful uh, palette for, for Bill to include sculptures everywhere. Here you see two metal sculptures, um, one outside of the pool area, and the other is the hanging sculpture in the men's spa room. Um, I just, thank you, you're helping me out. <laughs> I just love this man lounging in here because you know this is a, a, a Julia Shulman photograph. He had to pose him. I, I, I'm just thinking to myself, how do you ask someone, can you go get in that tub so I can take a photo of this great sculpture? Um, and one of my... Uh, favorites uh, of the way that he integrated art into his commissions was for the St. Teresa Church. Um, and the way he did that was he designed this beautiful baptismal font that's sculpted out of marble by craftsmen in Italy and has this bronze cap. Uh, and I know that it looks to me almost like an alien landed from outer space um, and left a big egg. Um, but it's also, a, it's right beneath a circular opening and in front of a stained glass window. So Bill strategically placed this beautiful baptismal font so that he allows the light to surround and illuminate the translucent marble. It has a great effect when you see it. And here are the, a closer view of the original, well, this is the original drawing, and it shows the, the pattern of the stained glass window, which was designed and executed by Joe Mays of Laguna Beach. So every part of the church was thought out 
where can you know, art be an integral uh, element of this sacred environment? Another house that really, I think, Cody cut his teeth um, you know, earlier on the Palm Springs Spa and St. Teresa Church, uh, and that allowed him to be so well prepared to work with clients and art collectors, Sam and Gladdy Rubenstein, whose residence at, is at Tamarisk. Here he de designed and completed their house in 1972, and Kathy, Cody, and I were so fortunate to interview Gladys and see the house before she passed away. And it was such an inspiration because she kept everything in the house exactly original to Cody, down to the drapes. And it was just a marvelous space. So it must have been exciting for Cody to collaborate with the renowned artist Claire Falkenstein, who designed these metal and glass entry double doors to the architect's specifications. These doors provide a magnificent threshold to the wonders that you see inside. Now that we've had an opportunity to explore the creative side of William Cody and learn about his natural artistic skills, I'm going to turn the conversation over to Emily Bills and Don Choi, who will contextualize Cody's architecture through the lens of his time and through the eyes of current students of architecture at Cal Poly, who are actively considering the legacy of Bill Cody. Emily. Thank you so much, Joe. And thank you, everyone, for coming today. We're all so excited about introducing our project to a Rancho Mirage audience. Um, I have the envi enviable, if not perhaps unenviable position of introducing some of the buildings themselves. Um, I say that because I'm sure those of you in the audience know this work much more in detail than I do, but I'm very excited about um, talking about a couple of those buildings that will feature in our exhibition today. Um, our exhibition, as Joe mentioned, is a partnership, and I mean that in a curatorial way. It's a real curatorial partnership with Don Choi and most of all, I think, his students who are interpreting um, some of the architecture in their own projects, and Don will talk about that when I'm done. Um, but in this way, our exhibition isn't considered or really conceived of as a monograph per se. We've selected about 10 of his projects, um, and we'll be looking at each of those projects through the lens of different um, areas of expertise or sort of themes or topics in Cody's work. Some of those will be engineering and construction techniques, his mastery at materials and texture, his expertise in dynamic residential hotel and master planning, um, the rich materials and his expertise in planning is everywhere in evidence in this first photograph I have up. Um, it's a wonderful Schulman photograph of the Del Marcos Hotel, and you can see this incredible texture in the building, but also the dynamics of the plan. We'll also talk about the relationship with fine art and interior design, which Joe has already wonderfully touched on um, in our presentation today. And then, of course, um, the incorporation of a certain lifestyle that kind of laid-back, fun-filled, um, and you know, uh, uh, leisurely lifestyle of those vacationing in Palm Springs, and really of Bill Cody himself, who had a great big belly laugh and loved to socialize. So all of these aspects of his projects will be incorporated into each of the buildings that we highlight at the exhibition. So I think most of these aspects um, of the design I'm going to try and do it all, the, the pointer, my computer, we'll see what happens here. Um, all of these things can really be seen in this project of the Del Marcos Hotel. And it almost seems as if, because this is the first project that really gains him a sort of national, if not international, acclaim. I believe it was published, and Kathy can let me know, um, in some Japanese journals. So he's, he's starting to be seen a, across the seas, um, landing in Palm Springs with this project right out of the gate. It looks, in fact, like a very simple elevation. Um, whoops, go back. I Maybe mean, you're not going to be able to do it all. Um, what at first glance seems like a simple elevation, in fact, if you look more closely, you see these different angles of the roof lines pushing past one another in front of what is an elongated, centered, um, elevated bridge-type form. Are you sure? Yeah. yeah. 
Okay. Those events are okay. 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 Sounds good. Um, so what looks like a simple elevation is actually an innovative plan and section with rich materials. In one fell swoop, desert modernism is everywhere in evidence in this early project. We see the rubble stonework, the painted redwood trim, and the lush landscape design that Cody oversaw himself. But what we see here is in fact many years experiment, um, experience and experimentation already under his belt. Um, one of the things I'm really interested in is placing Cody within his time period and thinking about the types of education that he had before he came out here to the desert. Um, before this time, he had already worked in an architecture firm, the USC uh, school architecture firm, um, and one of the classmates that he had that was working in that firm at the time was Thornton Abel, which some of you might know as one of the canonical case study house architects. So very lightweight post and beam approach to, to design. He's also at school with Calvin Straub, who will eventually become the dean of USC and sort of incorporates arts and crafts design with that lightweight case study house approach to architecture. So certainly these were both influences on his work. He was also an entrepreneur by this point. He'd been doing projects in Arizona and in Los Angeles. And as the story goes, another good one from Kathy Cody, he had his fellow architecture students working as drafts, person, uh, drafts people for him. He kicked his younger brother um, out of his bedroom, is this right, Kathy? And actually sets up an office in there with all of his fellow classmates uh, designing uh, plans and, and elevations for other architects in town. Um, and perhaps most important, he had sort of a two-way love affair with Cliff May, where Cliff May seeks him out as a student and he seeks out Cliff May and begins working for him um, on a number of projects, the most important being the Pace Setter House projects, at least the most important that I think from the perspective of the Del Marcos Hotel. So from this he develops some dynamic planning concepts. Um, thank you, Joe. This is a uh, pace at our house by Cliff May, and Cody did not work on these particular renderings or these plans, but what I wanted you to look at was the way in which um, a sort of rancho-style house that typically has very sort of 90-degree angled orthogonal planning structure, here is the wings of the house are actually starting to push out a little bit at an oblique. Um, so this is something that I think Cody picks up when he designs the Del Marcos Hotel. Now, I don't have a plan of the hotel, but you can see the sort of elevated bridge-like structure in the middle, and if you've been there before, those wings start to go out to the side a little bit. Um, I see a connect, direct connection with those pace-setter houses that Cliff May was doing and what Cody is incorporating into this early work. Another thing that he does here, though, um, Cliff May, all of these rancho houses that Cliff May designs are very much connected to the ground. Cody does something um, almost unimaginable coming out of work like that, is he lifts that center section of the Del Marcos Hotel up off the ground and it becomes this sort of floating bridge between these two wings that are actually quite lovely. And these wings create a welcoming environment around the pool, so again, lifestyle. Um, there are other influences of play here as well. Um, it's more than likely that Cody, who was at USC in the early 1940s, that him and his classmates were keeping a close eye on Frank Lloyd Wright and Taliesin West. They would have done this not only as students, um, but Cody is also designing projects in Arizona at the time when Wright was creating this canonical example of desert architecture for a modern period. Wright's building is on the bottom, Cody's Del Marcos Hotel is on the top. But you can see these very close connections here. Wright's low-slung building seems to grow out of the rubble desert ground, although it's domesticated in this image with a grass and pool. But the reason I wanted to show you this particular vantage point is because I'm wondering where did Cody get this door, this fantastic angular trapezoidal <laughs> shape that he emphasizes through this trim that goes around it. And you can see if, with the point. Yeah, it's sort of in shadow there on the screen. It's a little bit better on my computer. But you can see this punch that goes backwards in this window in the Taliesin structure that looks sort of like a trapezoidal window that's pushed back within the rubble stone. And I wonder if, in fact, there was a connection there and if uh, Cody had gone to see it. So I show this image because we can see echoes of Wright's red structural members and perhaps even that door in the Del Marcos, although Cody emphasizes the door with the express trim and, of course, the more dynamic shape. He takes it a step further. 
I love also the counterposed angles, the door frame, the first story of the roof line, which is at a different angle, and the second story above, which at this vantage point looks to be at even more of a counter angle. Um, I can take credit for that photograph myself. I wanted to show you those angles, not bad. Um, I'm also intrigued, however, and some of you in the audience might be able to help me along with this, by the work that Frank Lloyd Wright's son Lloyd Wright is doing in Joshua Tree at this time. You can again see these rubble stone walls, the deep connection to the ground, and those open trellises in Lloyd Wright's structures there at the bottom. And this was completed just at the same time that Cody was working on Del Marcos. It'd be interesting to know if he was aware of that work, and I think, of course, he must have been. The Del Marcos Hotel also expresses an early mastery of Cody's attention to creating segments or layers of public and private space. This is a, a wonderful thing to do for a hotel where you want to be out at the pool and socializing with other people that are there, but at the same time to re retreat back into your room. Um, uh, I will not brag about this photograph, which is not a very good one of the contemporary Del Marcos Hotel, but what I wanted to show is that you can see these individual private patios that come off of most of the lower level uh, hotel rooms at the Del Marcos. The one on the other side on the right would be Schulman's photograph. In this case, however, uh, that, that dynamic door leads right out to the street, so I'm thinking he must have taken off the curtains to take this photograph because there's absolutely nothing private about having your bed looking out to the road there. On the inside, those wings surround um, private or semi-private patios. On the top level, there would have been, what can I? Yeah, up here, there would have been sliding doors. They're not there anymore. They've created the uh, infill windows now. But in the beginning, there were sliding doors. So you could open up your space completely to the outside, sit on your chair, have a cocktail, and observe people down at the pool. Same on the lower level. You could sit out on these sort of semi-private patios that were right in front of your front door. So again, you have these layers, both private, semi-private, and then fully public. We also see in Del Marcos an incredible attention to detail, materials, and textures. This playfully poured concrete triangular stair tread echoes the geometries of the hotel. I think that's absolutely an exquisite detention, attention to what it would normally be seen as sort of a, a pedestrian aspect of a building. Um, I also think the stonework here is unlike anything Lloyd Wright or Frank Lloyd Wright is doing. This is not casually placed stones in a wall. Um, they're way too linear for that. I could see Cody going to the site and actually determining the placement of every single stone, especially those big pink ones, so that they're spaced perfectly distanced from one another. So this is definitely a more controlled orthogonal placement. The Del Marcos Hotel in Palm Springs brings Cody this great international acclaim, um, all the way to Havana, actually. Um, photographs were requested for use in the Pan American exhibition there, and likely led to commissions in that part of the world. Um, again, I'm going to ask for help, perhaps, from... Whoops, sorry. Right, I'm not <laughs> paying attention. Um, this is the Via Real Country Club in Havana, and we're still tracking down the history to this building, so if any of you guys are Havana architecture buffs, I believe it was actually built, um, but torn down under Castro as a part of the project to cleanse much of Havana of conspicuous signs of wealth and class division. Um, these uh, are wonderful renderings. Uh, Cody did the drawings here, probably not the coloring aspect of, of the drawing itself. Um, and uh, there were also construction drawings done for this project, so I'm guessing that it, it was actually built. Cody is a master at the private dwelling, and his own house shows experimentation. He creates a series of pavilions for the Cody house here. Um, this is a model linked together through roofs um, on, the, on the top and then through nature throughout the center of it. It's also with this project, I feel, that he becomes caught in this really interesting battle. Um, these two competing worlds in post-war American architecture at the time. Um, while we all recognize his designs as canonical examples of regional or quote-unquote desert modernism, uh, what we have here is also a clear engagement with the lightweight post and beam approach that was adopted by the case study house architects. And you can see this um, in the glass canopy that's cantilevering from its support on the exterior entryway. Um, and then also the corrugated aluminum cover over the carport on the right-hand side. 
And at first glance, it would seem to be a perfect contender for a spot in John Intenza's Art and Architecture magazine. I don't know if all of you are familiar with the great debate between John Intenza and Elizabeth Gordon, um, but Cody, I think the great ability for him to sort of have a foot in both camps and to not um, necessarily be pigeonholed into one or the other makes him one of um, probably one of the, the greatest modern architects of all time and somebody that we should really appreciate now. As Joe, I think, so smartly said, he moves away from that very sort of severe or minimalist approach to design to create these absolutely rich and wonderful interiors that people could live in and enjoy. Um, so on the one hand, he's very interested in these engineering feats. Um, at the other hand, he's also interested in having spaces that people can live in that speak to the surroundings that are around them. So John Intenza starts this uh, case study house program for Arts and Architecture magazine as kind of a universal response to the need for housing after the post-war period. Um, Elizabeth Gordon, who's the sharply intelligent editor of House Beautiful magazine, wages a battle against John Intenza. So you have these two magazines that are sort of duking it out. And she uh, advocates for this more regional approach to, or sort of traditionalist approach to modern design. Katie, case study house supporters will um, label her a, her project conservative, and perhaps in some ways it was, but it was a powerful one, and it shaped much of the modernist architecture and how it was designed at the time. This is a lovely line drawing that delineates the lightweight steel frame, the flat roofs, and the large glass slider that is more reminiscent of case study house design than Cliff May. But still, the conversation pit in the center there, one Kathy said people were always falling into, um, and the angular adobe and slump stone walls around the perimeter of the garden, this rich patterning in the materials and other features made Pauline Graves, who was a writer for House Beautiful, write to editor Elizabeth Gordon that this is clearly one of those pace setter houses. So she's trying to set him in the lineage of Cliff May and to situate him within uh, the House Beautiful project. And I actually have, um, I want to say an aside, the important role that women are playing at this time as writers, as editors, and as tastemakers in setting out what modernism will be to a broad populace. Um, I think that's really important for us to consider. Many of the architects were men, but the people who were making their careers, many of those were women. Um, so if you will bear with me, I thought I would read to you just a little bit what um, this wonderful letter that Elizabeth, um, I'm sorry, that Pauline Graves writes to Elizabeth Gordon about Cody's house. She says, um, and this is in 1952, um, Dear Elizabeth, a pace setter home is under construction of steel frame and wood stud partitions. Its great simplicity and delicacy of framing, the roof will not be over four inches thick, uses radiant heating under tile floors and a chiller system for refrigeration. The entrance has tinted glass um, under uh, tinted glass overhead and adjacent to the front entrance, divided by an obscure glass partition, was a small fish pond. The house was constructed on different levels, lending itself to the topography of the site with steps of wide tread and low risers. The living room contains a fire pit that was planned to have a copper hood suspended from the ceiling and, list and raised several inches off the floor. Foam rubber mats were placed around for lounging. And lounging, I would say, is what many people did in the house, as Cody was always one for socializing. Here in these older photographs, you can see wonderful expressions of levels and color and the texture that we can't actually see here that was in evidence throughout the house. So for example, the conversation pit, um, which you can see on the right-hand side there, you can see these very small tiles. Um, you had a sage green slate floor and small black tiles that were surrounding it, so the contrast there must have been wonderful. Um, a black and white image just doesn't do that justice. And also a raised dining area that had these, it was sort of a split level, not too high, and these couches that backed up upon the, the raised area. So the couches had front legs, but they didn't have back legs. The back of the couch was just sort of rested casually on this top level. Um, which is extremely inventive and fun, fun and playful. Um, in the back there, beyond the bedroom, you can see some uh, glass sliders. I don't know if you can point to that, the glass sliders. Yeah, exactly, and that led to the master bedroom. And in the roof of the master bedroom, there is a wood panel in the ceiling that you could pull back to see the sky. So you have this real connection between the outside and the inside coming in. 
Another aspect of Cody's work that we'll explore is his approach to master planning, particularly his contribution to resort housing centered around country clubs and golf greens. Um, this is, of course, something you guys all know very well here in Rancho Mirage, the Thunderbird Country Club in the States, which really kicked off his, his um, ability to express how he could situate homes on a large expanse of land. In this particular case, um, can I see that? Yeah, thank you. Um, the planning is still pretty conservative, um, organized across the street along these sort of uh, curvaceous roads, but we'll see very soon after that he completely breaks out of this and starts to have houses organized at different angles on a site. This is everywhere in evidence at the Horizon Hotel, which I think is an absolute masterpiece of planning, and I am happy to say I've incorporated talking about that big five-inch large book that did not have Cody in it. Um, as the coordinator of the Archipedia Project for Society of Architectural Historians, which is a list of a hundred important buildings here in California, I have made sure that this building, my own personal favorite, is there on that list, and that will be an open resource for everybody across the country and really the world to use. Um, this is a particular favorite of mine. At this, uh, for this particular project, he has plenty of space, a whole lot of money, um, and he can be really expressive as a result. So we move, see him move away from what he did at Thunderbird and create these sort of wonderful little pinwheel design cottages, these bungalows from, that run from studios to three bedrooms that are organized around a central pool area in the middle. I'm determined to come here and have a cocktail this evening after our presentation. So here's the pool. But you see, I mean, you have to have the axonometric, the plan view for this to really see the wonder of these different shaped roofs, these little pinwheel roofs, and everything is placed at just the right angle. I mean, it, it, this had to have built in, be built in, or uh, planned out in model form. You couldn't have done it any other way, where each little house is slightly placed at a different angle so that everybody has a view to the outside, but nobody is looking into their neighbor's patio. And, and that takes an incredible amount of skill and expertise to be able to do that. It's built for Jack Rather, who produced Lassie and the Lone Ranger, and epitomizes in a lot of way this glamorous Palm Springs getaway for the elite class of visitor coming from Los Angeles. This is a photograph by Julius Schulman, um, and there's no mistake here that he put that car on the side. It's, it's an absolute expression of driving to Palm Springs in your car, parking at your hotel, and going inside. Um, um, this is a place you drove to. It was a vacation retreat for the most stylish. And while visitors might live in conservative homes in L.A., when they came to Palm Springs, they wanted desert modernism. They wanted to relax in something that looked very Cody. Um, I love these little, these little interiors. I think they were designed by Emily Lazar. We're not sure about that, um, an important interior designer. And you can see in this black and white sort of the way in which the houses are spaced from one another, the little uh, casitas or bungalows. So they're small, but they're really maximized inside for private life and for comfortable living. This is a promotional image of the hotel as it stands now, and I'm only showing it to you because it gives you a color view of the organization of the structures on the site, but also of these uh, adobe walls that sort of partition off each building. We won't talk about the interiors here. I'm not sure how I feel yet. I need to stay overnight. <laughs> um, and also, of course, these dynamic roofs. These things are fantastic. These lightweight, transparent trellises that differ in this regard from the Del Marcos, which was a little bit heavier, um, and allows those plants to peek through. So again, using that earlier design that you saw that Joe showed of the, the plant peeking through, um, he's actually um, experimenting with that now. And this is a form he likes. You see it here at the Huddle Springs restaurant, probably one of the most important Googie Diner masterpieces, um, where much of his skill at engineering, materials, and dynamic planning, and car culture all come together in one building. It hurts my heart to know that this is not there anymore, as I'm sure it does many of you. Um, I do think it is one of the great masterpieces of architectural history. But here, of course, you see that triangular, um, let's see, that triangular roof line coming down here. 
Cordy is already experimenting this, with this form in something called a flame unit, which I don't have a date for, but it was definitely pre-Springs and much earlier. And I believe he also had a residence in San Diego he, where he was working with this form. Um, and it's important to remember, of course, that while he's at USC, he becomes very good friends with Eldon Davis, who is part of the partnership of Armet and Davis. Do you guys know the PANS? coffee house in Los Angeles. Have you stopped there for a burger anytime? Um, so Armet and Davis are the Googie architects for LA and they build a lot of these diners. Um, they're uh, sort of canonized in Alan Hess's book on Googie architecture. And uh, Eldon Davis and um, Bill Cody are very good friends. They're hanging out, they're socializing, and this structure right here is built at the same time that the Springs is coming out. So there's no doubt in my mind that they're having a conversation about the types of forms, the relationship to the street, and all of these kinds of things. Um, so their PANS project completed at the same year. But also, to go back to my more recent obsession with Lloyd Wright and the Joshua Tree structure, you see here um, those triangular roofs everywhere in evidence. And of course, Albert Frey will design his expressive gas station a little bit later that all of you know very well as the Palm Springs Visitor Center now. So what we have at this time are this, these sort of soaring engineering feats as manifested in these triangular roofs. They're everywhere in evidence. Roofs are extending way out like Wright. They're jutting into the air like Armet and Davis, and they're reaching almost, if not all the way in the case of Lloyd Wright, to the ground. But there's also an attention to the natural site here. It's not just the age of space age expressionists um, of the future. Here in the Huddle Springs, you see the Googie style borrowing again from Frank Lloyd Wright and his approach to incorporating the indigenous nature of the desert into the surroundings. Um, I think he must have borrowed directly, unless you guys know of a different source here, of those wonderful canvas screens. This was uh, initially a drafting room at Taliesin West, and those screens are used, um, I think they're over here, or up here, it's hard to see from my screen here, um, to shade the interior uh, eating areas within the this, this Springs um, Diner. Frank Lloyd Wright, of course, would never abide by Cody's frivolity. His integration of this playful signage and the topography and the stone you see here, this, no way. Wright would, would not abide by that at all. But Cody likes to have a little bit of fun, and he can really move very smoothly between these sort of um, upscale uh, country club type environments, but then also down to the very pedestrian diner that you see on the side of the road. And he's going to fill these areas not just with kind of tchotchkes and, and sort of slump off the materials of the inside. He's going to fill them with these absolutely wonderful um, mosaics by Miller Sheets, who's you know, one of the most respected muralists at the time, um, and still today, of course. So great respect even to the most um, pedestrian of structures. Oh, <laughs> I should actually show it. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Sorry, I'm trying to balance too many things. Um, I should give this back to you. Fired. Uh, the opposite of the diner, of course, is the country club. And perhaps the most elegant of his designs is for the El Dorado Country Club, which was designed for Robert P. McCullough. The club was marketed to the most elite clientele. And here it is rendered at night with fountains in full display and small waterfalls that were made by the trenches that are jetting out um, of the upper level. Entering El Dorado is all about classical grandeur and procession. Cody designs a lightweight modernist interpretation of a classical pavilion floating over a fairway with the pond on the mountains and in the background. A great Schulman uh, black and white photograph rendered here on the left shows that. And on the right, a long double loggia of poured thin shell concrete that we later see in the Palm Springs bathhouse. And it has this kind of Roman con uh, Compluvian, um, that's a hard word, Compluvian with an open center in the middle that lets the sky to come in and connect to the water of the pond in the center. What I'm really interested in here, and Don's students will take a close look at this, I'll turn it over to him in just a second, um, is El Dorado's Shamel residence and his construction of thinned layered roofs. 
I'd also like to take a second, though, to look at Cody's full mastery of modernist abstraction and his attention to solid and void. So this is the, uh, the front of the house here, and you see it's composed not just of sort of a solid facade, um, but really a complicated series of squares and rectangles. There's no clear pattern here, but it's clearly an abstracted cubist exercise. The materials are varied to express the pushing in and out of walls, and also the geometrical water feature at the bottom there, which I, for which I wish I had a plan, um, this feature seems to out Mondrian, Mondrian. <laughs> On the other side, however, you have this wonderful lightweight open pavilion with this thin slab roof and these horizontal members that are jutting out just beyond. So really what you're seeing here is a closed public facade that opens up on the other side to a very open sort of private backyard area. So socialization is going to happen um, in the private spaces of the house, not on the front porch. This is a very different way to organize space in the post-war period. Um, privatization happens in the country club, in the dining room, on the fairway, or at the private party poolside. This is endemic not only of the privatization of social life post-war, but also of a certain class of clientele. At the same time that you have comfortable living, you have engineering prowess in the design details, the so-called hush and flush, where the glass comes together at a point without mullions. There's going to be absolutely nothing here to interfere with your view of the fairway. Um, it seems uh, really that it's about visual um, connection with outside. Uh, don't get us wrong. This is also about Cody showing off what he can do. And boy, can he do it here. Um, we have no backslash. We have a micro-thin ceiling. Where is all the plumbing? How does he do it? He's definitely showing off what he can do um, with great and wonderful results. He also engages our ear and not just our eye. The water that's on the outside in that little pool comes all the way through the house into a small fountain. So you can imagine yourself in this space. It's quiet, um, and all you hear is sort of the splashing of water in, in the interior space of the house that you're in. It must have been incredibly calming. But we can't quite express all of Cody in, in black and white. We have to express him in color. His mother was an artist and an interior designer, and he worked closely with designers like Marcel Martinet and Arthur Elrod, and color absolutely has to be a part of the discussion if we're going to do any of his houses or his buildings justice. The wonderful black and white here rendered by Schulman, and then again rendered in color. You can see how this expansive overhang draws the eye outward, but the warmness of the wood really works with the green of the fairway on the outside and the desert plants in the background. And here this inventive fireplace that if you look on the side, you can see connects both inside with this sort of semi-inside, inside, outside atrium space. And this is the Cannon residence, which I really just wanted to show you because it's rendered so beautifully in color by Julia Schulman. These homes are organized on a country club, each individual, none mass produced, and in other ways, um, and others, are, and he's doing others of these at the time, um, ma manifested probably both masterfully um, and sort of the coda of his approach to this approach to designing um, at Tamaris Care and Rancho Mirage. This is a lovely streamlined drawing of the Jaffe residence with elongated arms and this thin roof line. And this casual entry um, of, to the pool, um, which sort of serves as the front of the house and not really the back in this particular um, example. Okay, so I wanted to end just, just very quickly um, with this last project that touches on another area of Cody's design that we want to explore, and that's the idea of lifestyle. Like many of his projects, the Palm String bath, Bathhouse spoke to the street and to the car. The long, thin shell loggia beckons the visitor into the spa, and it's almost an urban project in this way. But it's also space for fully immersing yourself in the desert spa experience, and Schulman is the perfect photographer for this building. His approach is about organizing people to act almost like furniture or set decorations in these modern spaces. But it's also about telling us how we're supposed to behave in the spaces. The architecture gets it right. Can we? Do we know how to be fully modern in our dress, in our pose, in our, in our state of repose as it comes to a spa? Um, and even how to reflect sort of the highly designed architecture. So you have this woman here. OK, I definitely need the pointer this time. Um, I'm not really sure what she's doing. 
she's standing here staring at this sculpture <laughs> with her knee bent, just sort of acting as another sculptural element herself. Um, and you can guarantee that Shulman had all of these women wearing their spa whites when he decided to do this photograph. This one is even more curious. Um, Sometimes the photos can seem a little ridiculous. This is what Life magazine would have loved. I'm not sure what she's doing here, hugging a classical column while two men chat in the background. And if you didn't think it could get any sillier, here Shulman picks out these specially colored unitards for the women working out in the gym. Whoops. Yellow and blue with the red background. Um, but I want to say, I mean, we're sort of, you know, laughing at, at the kinds of spaces that Shulman wants to photograph, but Cody is very thoughtful about what happens in all of these spaces, and he creates rooms and environments where people can talk and be casual and enjoy their time there at these moments or these opportunities for meeting. Cody has a sharp eye for color and detail. These loft, uh, lovely soft hues and turquoise and peaches in the mineral baths, everyone in positions of repose and conversation around the middle, um, their tan bodies almost camouflaged in their surroundings. This is truly an oasis. And then, of course, the hotel itself, which is built several years later, the car appears again. As the entrance to the bathhouse, same with that, there's a processional quality to the entrance to the hotel. Um, and please take some time to look at the way he renders the windows up here. Um, everything down to its detail. Again, Mondrian coming into play. Well, the whole complex is organized with, around these sort of angular wings. So think back, I'm bringing it to the end here. Think back to Del Marcos, right? But here on a much larger scale um, for this masterful hotel where before it was on a very small scale, now it's lifted up into this large hotel complex where people can just have a good time. The sliders allow these first floor rooms a semi-private patio near the pool so you can experience this indoor plan, and then experience this indoor-outdoor living. Um, and then Shulman, of course, expressing these semi-private uh, porches that allow neighbors to pass magazines to each other, I think. I'm not sure what's going on here, yelling down to each other from above as he sort of clings to the railing there at the top. Um, but these were spaces for your enjoyment. They were for relaxing and drinking and socializing. And this is the perfect embodiment, I think, um, of Cody himself, whose robust appetite for a good time was not only a great attribute in finding clients, which of course it was, it was also emblematic of his zest for life. And this is Bill and his wife, Winifred, Winnie, at the El Dorado Country Club. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I wanted to turn it over now to Don Choi, who's going to discuss how some of these, his students are interpreting these projects in their studio class. Thank you. It is uh, quite wonderful to be here and wonderful to see and hear what Joe and Emily have uh, talked about with Bill Cody because I don't know his work that well. This is my first time in Palm Springs, in the Palm Springs area, in Rancho Mirage. Um, but I got this idea with my students of looking at his work because his archives are actually, thanks to Kathy Cody, are held at Kennedy Library at Cal Poly. And so we thought, well, let's take a look and see what students today would think of, of, of Bill Cody's work. And so I offered a class to my students. These are senior students, um, 22 years old, 21. Um, and I said, well, let's take a look at these incredible drawings and so forth from the archives and see what you can learn from them and what they inspire you to do. Uh, so I had the distinct disadvantage compared with Joe and Emily. They were talking about a remarkable architect who was a kind of art prodigy. And I'm talking about typical 21-year-old Cal Poly students. Um, so, what you're going to see is not as exciting as what Bill Cody did, of course, but what I think is interesting is to look at how the next generation of architects sees the work of Bill Cody and of desert modernism. So let's take a look. I hear some of my students here working in our wood shop, and one of the fascinating things about what's happening with the students is that they are working with old-fashioned techniques like welding steel rod. They're working on their computers using CNC routers and laser cutters. Uh, they're drawing by hand. None of them can draw like Bill Cody, uh, of course. Um, 
And so what's fascinating is that they're combining all these different techniques, some of them age old, like welding, and some very modern. And we'll take a look at this in detail in just a moment. So uh, one of my groups of students was interested in this idea of lifestyle that, that's come up uh, in the buildings that Joe and Emily have showed you already. This idea that there was this kind of leisure lifestyle that develops in Southern California, especially here in the Palm Springs area. And so two of my students said, well, what do we want to do? We're 22 years old. We're going to do a cocktail cart. <laughs> and so they thought about this. And they said, well, here's what we're going to do. In some of these buildings, like the Shamal House, we have these wonderful lightweight steel columns and these overhanging planes of the roofs. And so they said, well, our cocktail cart is going to have this skinny welded metal frame that you see here. And then it's going to have these big uh, horizontal planes that are going to serve as the shelves. Um, and so they went out to Goodwill and they bought themselves a bunch of tumblers and so forth. And uh, they said, well, in order to make those shells, what we're going to do is we're going to take a bunch of blocks of wood, we're going to glue them together and make, make a kind of butcher block table out of them. So this is a very kind of low-tech thing, a bunch of clamps, a bunch of carpenter's glue, you glue that thing together. But in order to make that a suitable cocktail cart, what they do is they say, well, we're going to actually use our CNC router, our computer numeric controlled router, and we're going to use uh, modern software. And so the computer is actually going to take that, this very rough slab here that they glued together, and it's going to do this. So it's going to route out all the depressions for the ice bucket and the coasters and surstics and olives and so forth. Uh, and here is a file that they're using to do that. Um, so they're taking this kind of 1950s, 60s inspired idea of a cocktail cart, but they're going to execute it using modern 21st century fabrication techniques. I have to warn you, though, that uh, students being students, most of these projects are still kind of under, under construction. Uh, so they'll hopefully be on display at the exhibition this summer. So we hope that some of you will make it out to L.A. and see the real things in person. And uh, when Joe was talking about how Bill Cody was a remarkable artist as well as um, an architect, he was a true designer in many fields, uh, it reminded me too of, of the lettering that he did. And so whether it's on his student drawings down here or his professional practice drawings up here, he had a, a very distinctive set of fonts that he used. And of course, this is back in the day when every letter was drawn by hand. And so a couple of my students said, you know, this is fascinating. And wouldn't it be wonderful to create a modern digital font that is based on what William Cody hand-lettered 50 years ago? And so they went through his drawings in the archives. And they tried to find examples of every letter. And so you see those, uh, some examples from the drawings here. And here are the letters they found. Uh, they couldn't find any cues, at least not so far. And so what they're going to do is based on the drawing letters, they're going to come up with a let, uh, they're going to create a digital letter for each of the 26 letters, and then that should be pretty straightforward. It turns out, some of you out there might, might have worked with, with type before, and you will know this, but the spacing between letters is very complicated. So what my students are doing now is the, the long process of kerning. There are over a thousand combinations of letters next to each other that have to be adjusted by eye, so they're going through, and for the most common letter combinations, doing individually adjusting the spacing of those letters to create a font that you would be able to put on your computer and use the same, in the same way that you would use Times New Roman or Arial or any of the fonts that you use on your Mac or your PC today. So hopefully that will all be done uh, sometime before this summer. We should use that graphic in our show. Um, and the, uh, this idea of lifestyle um, comes up, of course, with the Springs restaurant. And Emily talked so wonderfully about the relationship between Googie Architecture and maybe Lloyd Wright and this restaurant. And so uh, a group of my students looked at this, and they loved the kind of Googiness of this, the way that it was modern, but it wasn't, it wasn't sterile, right? It wasn't bland or sterile or impersonal. And so they looked at images of the light fixtures inside. And one of the things about the Springs restaurant, sadly destroyed, like Emily said, is that there were so many different kinds of light fixtures. It wasn't like he just picked one up out of a catalog. And so these, sorry, these, 
these conical ones here, these here, these here, there's kind of strip lighting with fluorescent tubes in it there. So my students thought, well, let's do our own light fixture. But what they're going to do is they're going to use our laser cutter. And so inspired by the shapes that you see them uh, sketching here, they came up with these ideas for cutting forms out of a, uh, a slab of material. One of the things about the laser cutter is you can cut wood, you can cut acrylic, uh, you can cut cardboard. Um, and so here they have a mock-up out of cardboard, a very early one, and they're playing these shapes, the angles and curves inspired by that restaurant. And uh, here is a, a later model. And so you can see they have these different shapes that they cut with a laser cutter, and they combine those, and of course the light goes inside here, so then you get a kind of form that's reminiscent of what Bill Cody might have done at the El Dorado Country Club or at the Springs Restaurant, but now it's done using 21st century technology. So they're going to play around with different colors of acrylic uh, and maybe use uh, some plywood, like a walnut plywood as well, so you can have a great number of different variations using the same basic design. Uh, and here is one of their latest mock-ups in cardboard. So one of the wonderful things about this process is you can do the computer file, do a mock-up very quickly, and then experiment with, with materials and forms um, in a kind of cyclical pattern. Now, uh, you've already seen a, a few images of the sadly demolished Shamel House. And this is one of the houses that, that has a really wonderful structure of lightweight steel columns. And so as my students looked at that, they wanted to know, well, actually, how is this thing put together? So they went into the archives and looked at the construction documents and so forth. And so they did this uh, fairly straightforward digital uh, model showing the different layers. And you can see it has tubular steel columns, very, very lightweight. But the horizontal structure is actually wooden beams. And this is wonderful because the columns disappear. But the beams have this presence here. They kind of stick out here. And so the beams and columns are different materials, and they, have, they kind of have a different function. The beams are kind of horizontal and kind of sheltering. Um, and the columns are very thin, and they kind of disappear. And so they did this uh, digital model. And they also want to do a physical model. But this is a physical model uh, done very differently than the ones that Bill Cody and his associates would have done in the office. Those were all cut by hand. This one is mostly cut with the laser cutter. And so these are the different layers of the base they're doing here. Uh, and here they've uh, glued them together, put on the superstructure here. And they also put in the roof rafters and put in the structure at the corner too so you can understand how the different bays are actually constructed you know, inside, inside the roof slab. They also realized that steel construction was one of the aspects of architecture emphasized in a lot of modernist writing. Right? But when it actually came down to doing a building out of steel, well, there are far fewer steel buildings actually built than you would guess based on all the writing about steel buildings. And so they looked at the Shamel House and realized that, that in, in many of Cody's works, he would use a kind of hybrid structure of steel and wood because obviously the two materials have different properties. And so in some contexts, wood was better than steel. In another context, steel was better than wood. And this is another way in which we see how adaptable and how flexible and how creative Bill Cody was. Right? He didn't just have one system, but he could adapt uh, his structure to each commission. And in comparison, for instance, well, here is a, the structural diagram that two of my students did of the Shamel House. And um, the, uh, these lines here are actually the, the rafters the smaller horizontal elements. And you can see it's a quite large house based on kind of a square grid. Um, the rafters run in different directions. There are open areas um, that have skylights in them. So it's a very flexible kind of structural system. You can do a lot within that kind of grid. And in comparison, here's a model of the famous Eames house in Pacific Palisades. Uh, this was off the shelf parts, so skinny columns and, and small steel trusses. But it's a very, 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 um, kind of a formulaic way to do a building. You have bays of seven by 20 feet made out of prefab components. You can see the little trusses up here. So it's a fantastic house. Um, but Bill Cody was not looking for a kind of standard way to do every building. He was looking for a kind of um, a set of parts that he could adapt to each one of his uh, buildings. 
And here, uh, in these wonderful photographs, you see the, the thinness, the lightness of the structure, and how you get to experience the outdoors when you're inside the house, uh, as Emily showed in some of the other photos uh, of this and other similar houses. And that lightness really inspired some of my students. Um, and I charged them not with trying to recreate something that Bill Cody did, but I asked them to look at Bill Cody's work and think about what inspired them. Right? I, I wanted to know what it meant for a 21st century architecture student uh, to look at a building from the 1960s. Um, and they were really inspired by the materials, by the indoor-outdoor relationships, and by this kind of lightness. And so several of my students decided, well, we want to do a, a piece of furniture. We want, we want to do a table. And first they did this, which looks actually a lot like the structure of the Shamal House, right? With its kind of projecting beams and so forth. So first they did something very literal that looked like the structure of the Shamal House. And they realized that that didn't fit the spirit of the lightness of that building. So what they did instead is thought about, well, what's the lightest we can make the structure and still have the thing stand up? You know, with furniture there's no code, so even if it does fall down, it's not that big a deal. Uh, and so they went through these other ideas, and this is what they're working on now. So they're taking a quarter-inch steel rod, right, only, only this big, and welding it together. Again, a very kind of hands-on, very, very, not primitive, but very old-fashioned technique. So they're creating this kind of, um, sorry, system of trusses. The, the structure is tri triangulated. You can see triangles here to make it stiff, but the actual members are only one quarter inch in diameter. So they're trying to make it very, very, very lightweight and elegant. And so that's all done by hand, of course. Um, but they're also interested in materials in the way Bill Cody was. And one of the students found in his father's yard a bunch of old growth redwood lumber that had just been lying out there for decades. And so this is the kind of lumber you can't buy, at least not, you know, unless you want to go on the black market. Uh, but look at this gorgeous, gorgeous grain in this old growth redwood. And so what they've done is plane it down. That's the original surface there. It's, it's weathered and gray and quite lovely. They've planed it down, the kind of pristine wooden interior with that incredible grain. And then they've put it together like this. These are little tiny, like two by two inch sticks. So they put it together like this. And they've taken the, the CNC router and programmed it to cut the bottom of the table so it has a very nice bevel, and it also has a, um, a channel that will accept the top uh, piece of this. So that wood piece fits down perfectly on top of that welded uh, steel base. And so this is a wonderful example of the interest in, in materials they get from Bill Cody, the interest in the lightness of structure. And so they're doing something that, that doesn't look like anything that Bill Cody does, but it's inspired by the same kinds of things, I think, that Cody was looking at himself. Um, and finally, the Church of St. Teresa. And my students were interested in this because it's so different. It's very modern, but it's also a very spiritual and very kind of, um, in a way, a sensuous place. You saw images before, images before the curves and the stained glass. And you see the wonderful curves of those concrete walls there. And here's Bill Cody's drawing for the altar. It's a very simple marble altar, um, but one that was... Um, quite delicate in, in places, it has this beautiful curve here. Apparently, in Ka I think I heard this from Kathy herself, there were issues in, in making this thing because nobody wanted to cut marble that thin because they were afraid it would break. So they actually had to have this thing made in Italy, as I recall. Um, and so my students looked at this lovely curve here and they thought, well, what can we do? Not out of marble. Uh, we're a state university, we can't afford marble. Uh, <laughs> but out of some other material. So they looked at this wonderful curve here, and they said, well, what can we do? So they made all kinds of sketches, as architects do. And I warned you, my students don't draw quite as well as Bill Cody's. <laughs> but they thought, looked at that wonderful curve, and they said, well, let's do a lightweight steel base. Again, these are students going into the shop, bending steel rod by hand and welding it together. Uh, so they're doing this lightweight steel base. And then a seat, which is based on this curve of the altar that we see here. And they said, well, we're going to try two of these. It's always a good idea to try two of something in case one doesn't work out. And um, 
So here's that metal base. And so you can see the lovely curve here. It's joined here for stiffness. Uh, and these are the steel. Uh, this is upside down. So these steel plates then get bolted into the bottom of this. Um, and this is one of them that, working on, that they're working on. And the idea is that they're going to put a, a foam form in here. And they're going to take concrete and actually cover this thing with concrete uh, because they're inspired by this lovely concrete walls on the outside of St. Teresa. I warned them, I said, you know, it might be easier just to make this out of wood, but you know, <laughs> students are, are students. And learning, right, you learn by doing, you learn by making mistakes. So at any rate, uh, we hope to have one or two of these in a perfected form at the exhibit in Los Angeles uh, in July. So we hope you can visit them then. So that's all I have to say about my students, but uh, I have to say it's been a fantastic experience. At Cal Poly, our, our motto is learn by doing. And so my students have been learning by doing by going into the archives and learning about archive research. They're learning by doing by getting into the wood shop and by, by welding. They're learning by doing by, by applying all their skills and knowledge to actually making these objects. So it's been an incredible experience for me and my students. And I'm, I'm really grateful to Kathy Cody and to Emily and, and to Joe for, for helping us get involved in this. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Emily. Um, this is why you get involved in these projects for 10 years, because even you can learn something every moment. Um, I just want to say that we are here to answer any questions. Um, we don't have a lot of time. Of course, we, like Bill Cody, um, Inter we wanted to entertain you. So um, I want to invite, though, uh, Kathy Cody to come up, and she is available to answer any questions. And Lynn Cody, um, I want you to, uh, as well, so we can acknowledge you, the two daughters of uh, Bill Cody. And then um, I also want to ask Melissa Ritchie uh, if you would stand up and tell the audience, or you don't have a mic, but I can, you can use this mic right here, and we can turn it on. So you can tell the audience what, um, what project you're working on for Cody. It's on. It's okay, on. can you hear me? Yes, I think so. Uh, my name is Melissa Ritchie. I'm a resident of Rancho Mirage, and I'm a mid-century modern enthusiast and a regular attendee at Modernism Week. And uh, about six months ago, I decided there's such a fantastic architectural legacy in this city that no one ever really talks about. Uh, individual houses are quite well known, but um, the legacy of architecture in the city hasn't really been acknowledged. So I'm writing a book to correct that. And um, through the writing of the book and the researching of the book, I've been fortunate enough to meet Kathy and get to know several of the members of the city's Historic Preservation Commission. I live in a mid-century modern community as well, uh, not designed by Cody, sadly, but <laughs> we can't have everything. Um, and I wanted to uh, just let everybody know that, first of all, and also just ask a general question or have a show of hands. How many people here live in Rancho Mirage and how many people live in a mid-century home? Okay, um, I'd love to speak to you and hear from you, so um, once this session is over, do come and find me. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation, it's fascinating. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> the, the same goes for us. Um, we, after we, we convene, we'll have somebody in the back of the room with a, a notebook. And um, if you live in a Cody house, and you'd like to share your experience and your environment with us, we'd love to have your contact information because that's how we'll be able to really um, annoy you in the next, in the next couple of months. Um, so are there any questions? And you can direct them to anybody on the panel. Um, yes, go ahead, Kathy. We're actually privileged. Here, here. Let me turn it on for you. So um, we're honored to um, have a guest here today. You have to put it closer. 
Okay. Morris Gandarian, he, he did the drawings for the uh, St. Teresa's Church, and he's here. And Morris, would you like to share some of your experiences doing your drawings? <laughs> you can use the mic up on the podium, too. Well, thank you for uh, yeah, that introduction. I had the honor of working with Bill 1967 to 1969, uh, at the ripe old age of 25 years old, Bill called me and through one of the colleagues in his office and he said, I understand you have some experience in construction. I'd been out of school, Cal Poly, for uh, <laughs> three years and my first job was in construction so I was highly experienced in construction in Bill's eyes. So he said, well, that's more construction experience than any of us have in the office, so why don't you come out and let's talk. So I got in my car, drove to Palm Springs from Pasadena, and uh, took the job as the project architect for the St. Teresa's Church. The bill had already done the design and the working drawings, and they, they were looking for somebody to supervise the construction and be on site all day, every day. And that was about a 60-hour uh, a week, 60-hour a week job. I also had the, the privilege of working with Michael Nolan, the father at the time, and, and designing all the interiors for, uh, with Bill. As was noted earlier, Bill did not only the architectural design, he did all the interiors, all the details, and if all of you have been in the church, the holy water font, the baptismal fonts, the, uh, the pews, the altars, all that had Bill's hand in it from beginning to end. And I did the drawings, but on every turn, if I did a curve, Bill came in and said, no, you've got to do it slightly less than that. And then I'd do it again, and he'd come in, you're not quite there yet. So <laughs> he, he massaged it, massaged it, massaged it until it was perfect. Then he said, now find me somebody to build all these altars. <laughs> so we, and, and then he would just say that and leave and expect it to get taken care of. So. We searched everywhere. We went to Colorado, Vermont, Florida. Uh, nobody would build them. Somebody said here earlier that, that the shapes were too thin and they wouldn't guarantee them. We found a company in uh, Vermont that would build the main altar. And if you've seen, you've been in the church, you've seen the main altar, which is about 10 feet long and, and is four inches thick in the middle. Mm -hmm. And that altar weighs about 10,000 pounds. And they said, we can't build it. Uh, but, a, but a company in Vermont said, we will build it for $40,000, which was, by today's standards, would be like $4 million. <laughs> So we did find a company in Los Angeles who told us they would do all the accoutrements inside and the altars for a grand sum of $10,000 in travertine. And Bill said, let's hire them. And I'm freaking out. How can anybody build all of this for $10,000 when one company was going to do just the main altar for 40000 But he trusted him. Um, if you could all have experienced the day, all this stuff showed up in crates. And we stood there with our fingers crossed. And they opened that big altar. And we all crawled on the floor and looked up the underside of that thin four-inch slab. And they had engraved and recessed steel plates in the center. and. Uh, uh, stiffened it and guaranteed it and it and it's there today so that's uh, if any of you have any interest in any of the other stories on any of the building I'm, I'm happy to share it with you well the, the the company in Los Angeles was a, a, a company who did uh, religious artifacts and and pews and things like that, but they had never done marble work before, but they had an affiliate in Italy, and, and it was done in Italy. Uh, the egg, the baptismal font uh, in the center, that was done in Italy with just the very, very minimal drawings. The shape of the egg, the top was to be bronze, and it was to not hinge off, which was my uh, suggestion to Bill, we just hinge it and have a chain or something hold it so it wouldn't fall on the floor once it opened. And he said, no, I want it to hinge and 
pivot off and cantilever <laughs> and nobody knew how thick to make the spindle to allow it to cantilever. Uh, we didn't know if it should be a half an inch or one inch or, or, or what, or whether, whether it would even work. And so we trusted, we sent it. Uh, Father Nolan said, trust them. They know what they're doing. They've been doing this for hundreds of years. It's not up to you to design it. So when it came and the egg they uncrated it, set it on the bronze base, and we took the pivot, and we pushed it, and it's all on a little ball bearing pivot, and it cantilevered out, and it didn't deflect an eighth of an inch. And if you've ever been there to see it, I assume it's still working that way. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't seen it operate in, uh, in years, but every time I come to Palm Springs, I live in Laguna Beach right now, but. Every time I come to Palm Springs, me and my wife, Stephanie, we visit the church just to reminisce. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Morris. It.